We want to take a hold on the agenda here. We're going to move the discussion regarding the, the local senior housing up on our agenda. Um, what do you think, Vince? After the annual budget review, we want it before that. Either. Uh, why don't we do it before that? That way they can leave and get back to work. It's between seven and eight, or seven and eight. Sure. Everybody okay with that? Yeah. All right. All those in favor? All right. Great. How about our minutes from our August eighth meeting? I make a motion we accept the minutes for the August eighth meeting. Second. Any discussion on the minutes? Not all in favor? Aye. Okay. Are there any public comments? I didn't get any written public comments. Okay. Are there any supervisors here not seated as committee members that have any information for this committee? Oh. All right, well, a government center project update. Good morning, everyone. Just have a, a few slides to show you here on the government center and how it's going. <laughs> Thanks, Claire. Um, first slide here, August 23rd. I did give this to um public uh, works committee last week. Um August 23rd, our chiller died finally. Uh, we have no AC in the building, so we ended up having to get uh three five ton units brought up and we installed them in the penthouse instead of trying to put them in the hallways. We can run them through our current air system. Um, that being said, with the hot temperatures we've had and the new windows on the south side of the buildings where we're still waiting on the blinds, um, it was still pretty unbearable in there for some of the offices. Uh, in there, so we are trying on it, but um, our chillers um, are still not being delivered till I believe February. Uh, next slide. Um, we did do some asbestos abatement. Um, in the HR department, it was underneath the carpeting when they changed out the tiles and never removed the glue back in the day where they would take that glue along with um, we tested the boiler in one area when they were removing it, they found another area that had asbestos in it, so we had to take that out. Uh, that asbestos abatement was about $9,200 that is um, that was planned for in the overage I talked about last month at the county board. Um, the only other asbestos we think we may find is that the inside of the boiler, we may find asbestos, and we don't know that until we remove the asbestos and they take it off site. So that might be another one coming. Uh, we did, uh, they did do the roof last week with the exception of the capping on it. We did find one area up here, if you notice, it's a rubber mem membrane roof, um, 20 by 25 that was uh, rotted out and insulation underneath was wet um, that we did not know was leaking. So they found that, that area in there. Next slide. Uh, you can see the main lobby now has um, a little bit more different lighting in it. Um, these panels will be changed out when the new ceiling, the original ones come in that are supposed to be there. We're still waiting on windows. Uh, lead times seem to be the biggest thing right now as we try to transition. In this phase two, we are looking at office, office occupancy on October 10th. So that week we'll be moving back again on the top floor, uh, taking administration this and IT and moving those out of that area on that side of the building we can get in there and do that uh, we should be able to move um, the vets and all that back up to the main level and do those and move ADF2 so that's moving along quite nicely again lead times uh key switches generators through December 1st transfer switches in March main electrical gear February fillers mid-March now we're coming into cooling season, so we're out of that side, so that's good. The coiling doors for the are still expected the 8th and 9th of September. Uh, when we do those, those are the fire doors for the customer service windows. We'll do two at a time so we don't disrupt all the windows at once. The wood doors, um, hopefully the end of October, we're waiting on those. And the air handling units, um, mid-October, um, on those items still. So it's still a process of do as much work as we can, get the offices and get it done. 
uh, but moving along uh, rather quickly. Then the next item on the agenda is the Justice Center roof, and I talked briefly about that county board. When we went with the 2.1, we got estimates on a rubber roof membrane roof, been working with a manufacturer of roofing supplies that does the product for the roofing uh, to try to get a better product for us. And this is kind of the breakdown of that with a rubber membrane roof. You know, it is just a rubber membrane laid up there and they put rock on top of ballast. So it is susceptible to hail damage or if someone steps on it wrong, they could put a hole in it. Um, the thickness of it is uh, 60 mils. A multi-ply system is 380 mils. So a much, when we're talking 380 mils, we're talking like a half inch. It's not super thick uh, versus um, the rubber membrane. The single ply roof, the cost of over the years of that roof, um, 2.1 million, we estimated that at is what we got our quotes. Um, but it's a 20 year life cycle usually on the roof. We can't go on a little bit further than that, but in 2043, possibly we need another roof. The multi roof, that is a 20 year life expectancy, smaller warranty. The multi layer roof, we spend an additional 500,000 up front. Um, we get a 30 year warranty and a year 30, we do some work, we get another 10 year, we get a 40 year warranty on that roof. Um, and over the life of the roof, we save the taxpayer for about $2.3 million over the life of that roof. I did put this in the budget as a uh, spending request to um, pay a little bit more up front to get better product for us in the long, long run. So just wanted to break that down for you as we're talking uh, budget discussion. That's it. Questions? Uh -huh. So I have one question. So the the that twenty by twenty five section or whatever you found that was bad. That didn't did that add extra cost? Or? It added a thousand dollars. They had the insulation on hand, luckily, okay. uh, to replace it. So it was a thousand dollar repair for that. And I did attach the weekly update from Mark and Johnson on the project. You can, um, all right, thank you. That actually brings us to the Justice Center roof options, or did you cover that? I did just cover that. Questions on that? Anything you need to make a move on? Or? No, I, I wanted you to be aware of it because when I present the budget, uh, that may be an option. I mean, it's, it's a lot of money up front, it's a lot of years out in advance. Uh, and when we get a final look at what the budget looks like, maybe we'll just make more informed decisions whether or not we can recommend All right, at this time, nothing. All right. Well, um, now bring us to our discussion regarding the local senior housing. <clears throat> All right. Well, thanks for having us back again. Obviously, uh, you know, we enjoy being here, but we're hoping that maybe this is the last time you see us. <laughs> so what we really want to do today is try and answer any final questions that have come up regarding the senior housing. We have a few more pieces of information that have been requested by us. Um, Aaron Moore, FNC Bank, Nelson Blanchard, Compass Realty Group. Um, for those that, and we're, the one we're missing is Pam Clinkfoot. Uh, she's part of our committee and she's with the Christian Community Home. So she's helped put this all together as I've said in the past. But we really just want to try and bring this to a point today where you get your questions answered so that we can have a, a point to move forward uh, with this if the county wants to move forward with it. Um, so the first thing, uh, Claire, if you want to go to the next slide, some of this you've, you've seen already, but you know the need is, is well established. I don't think we need to harp on the need. Uh, both the housing study and our little study and probably friends and family that you've talked with have identified that the need is there. So Claire, if you want to go to the next one. <clears throat> Again, you've seen this before, but I just wanted to uh, point back to something that the county has uh, already invested in, and that is the study that shows, you know, our senior housing issue and our senior population is not something that's going away. Uh, it's something that we need to address, and it's something that with this program, we can take an active role in trying to help solve. I want to go to the next one, Claire. So I'm going to turn this one over to Allison since she's our real estate expert. 
This is just a slide that kind of shows what the trickle down effects will be if we can get some housing. Our first seller is an older couple in their 70s. Um, they're from Clear Lake and they're looking to downsize. Their home will sell for 210,000. And all of these are examples, but people that we actually have in the area. Our buyer for this one works at a hospital in town and has been looking for a rental or a home for a while and will be moving from a rental. Similar to our <clears throat> sales, um, our rental options are, are quite few. So a new rental would then be available if she could buy this house if these guys had somewhere to go. Similarly, our second seller is a woman in her 80s. She lives on her own and it is not safe for her. Um, her home is on six acres in Amory. She has a two-car garage with a finished basement. It would sell for 185 because it needs some updates. Uh, we have a potential buyer for this one. It's a family with two kids. Dad works in Amory. Mom works in Osceola. Um, once again, they would buy this house, but she has nowhere to go currently. She has been on a waiting list for quite some time in Amory, and she is currently number eight on the list, and that's after waiting um, years. So um, if this family were to move in, we would then have yet another home to sell um, at 150000 our last one is a couple looking to downsize. They have a split level, um, three acres in Centuria area. Um, this buyer is a, a family with three kids. Dad got a new job in St. Croix Falls. They're moving in from Iowa. Um, and just to point out, a lot of the people that we do have moving in aren't just moving in because it's a random place. A lot of them have connections to uh, people in the area. And this family has a brother who lives in Lock. So um, this just shows that if these people could all move, we have quite a trickle down effect of homes that will then be available. People who will finally get to buy something that they're looking for, as well as some rental options as well. Any questions on that specifically? We do have those letters as well. Do you want we them have, to come out now? I, I do have letters, which I didn't uh, have time to enter into any official thing, but I can give them to Lisa afterwards, but from two seniors uh, in the area. That kind of attests to the fact that if they had a place to go to, their houses would be for sale right now. And one of them is in the 210 price range. Yep. Is that the is that this one is of those? Scenarios? Actual seller number one sent the letter and seller number three. So uh you know, part of the questioning was, you know, is is that something that would be applicable to our area? And these are both market rate opportunities. Um, that seems to be, at least from what I've heard, market rate is really where the need is at. It's not about the uh, low income type scenarios uh, or disability type scenarios. It's really those people looking just to transition from their existing home. Um, and the, the one story I have of that, which is kind of my poster child for workforce housing in Polk County as the EDC guy is the manager of the new f and uh, uh, what was the f and dairy is now Sweet Additions. There's a guy making, you know, six figures that runs that whole operation. He could not find a place to live. Now that addresses more workforce housing, but he ended up buying more of a senior place out near Luck with some acreage of people that were moving on. So um, just the, the scenario for, for the fact that the aged population has such a strong presence here, that's where the bulk of our, our housing is right now. Go on, Claire, please. So this is kind of what we were, you know, we really haven't changed this much. We have taken into account a lot of the feedback and comments that we've gotten from you guys. Um, we still feel pretty strongly it should be a 50% grant, 50% loan. The reason being is we were initially talking maybe 100% loan at 0%. Well, a lot of these builders have access to lines of credit as it is. So by removing that grant option, we felt it kind of takes away the incentive piece of it. It's great having zero money, but it's not as great of an incentive as being able to actually offer something to attract their business to the area. So we are keeping a 50% grant, 50% loan. Again, all of this is kind of open to discussion at this point because it's just a concept. We'd have to run it through um, our legal counsel and, and get that all uh, put aside. But capped at 400,000 per developer, 10,000 per unit, repaid. So it kind of becomes a revolving loan that the county can use again, again. Uh, as future needs occur. Next slide, Claire. So our funding request hasn't changed a million and a half. Uh, either ARPIT funds or county budget dollars could come out of. Uh, zero loan portion would serve as a revolving loan. Eligibility is first come, first serve. So wouldn't that be an awesome problem to have if we would 
burn through uh, that million and a half first year. Um, no requirement that the developer that the developer or builder be based in our area. No requirement to prove need, um, and it can be market rate or low income. So none of that has really changed as far as how we're proposing. Next slide, Claire. So some optional considerations because we want to, you know, be able to try and work with this program as well. We are and could have a, a one year or 18 month review period. So if the county sets aside these dollars, there are a few projects and I can't uh, speak of where or how they are, but there are some projects that are happening right now that would take advantage of this program um, if this program was available. Um, what we'd like to propose is that one year from now, the same board or maybe somewhere else in the county just reviews this and says, hey, is this working for us or not? And if it's not working, let's pull those funds and apply them to something else that would be more beneficial to the county. And, and we're fine with that because I feel that the need is strong enough there that it, that it is going to be utilized. There's no requirement for additional funding. Again, of course, it would be great if this was highly successful and we burned through a million and a half in the first few months with people applying for those loans. Um, but there's no additional funding needed for this program. This is going to be just an ongoing fund once it's established and people are using it. Unless the county wants to contribute more to its success, if it's successful, then you can contribute more. I think if, if the county was seeing the benefits that we think could come from this program, it could be that years down the road, they maybe want to say, hey, maybe we should carve out some more money if that's available to fund this program again, which is already set up, all of the legal work and all of that has been done and in place already. So that would be a great problem to have, but it's not a requirement. So again, it just shows leadership for the county. It shows that we want and recognize that we have a need within our county for this type of housing. And here's how we'd like to solve it. Kind of similar to broadband and, and thankfully Polk County was ahead of the curve when it came to broadband. They had recognized the need long before COVID, and some of those programs that helped us establish broadband in our area uh, were already in place. So it provides an option that is not available in other counties. Next slide, Claire. So some of the things we've already done. Uh, we've identified builder developer interest. Uh, Derek Builders was here. Christian Community Homes is part of our community. Berkhammer Builders, that was the example I gave a presentation or two ago. Those are all builders and developers that have shown interest in this that we've been able to bring in as examples. Management of the program, we had Lynn uh, Nelson from West Central Wisconsin Regional Planning come in, and of course, Cedar Corp is another option. We, they, they could both manage it, and there's probably others. Municipal interest, these are all the municipalities that we've talked with that have shown interest in this program. Um, they have a hard time saying how they would support it because they don't have an actual program for a development presented to them right now. So what they would do for infrastructure or PIF funding or anything else is, is somewhat uh, to be determined by the size of the project that is brought in. And then we showed some other successful programs that have turned brownfield sites, historic renovation, um, and town village infill. And that's actually one of the projects going on right now that would take advantage of this program is there's some town and village infill going on in one of our communities that would take advantage of this program if it were available. Next slide, Claire. So I took a look at a couple of the privately owned senior facilities that we have. I happened to look at two of them in Osceola and based on the tax roll, what they pay in taxes annually and how many units there are, that worked out to annual real estate tax revenue of $850 per unit. Now there's no way of knowing for the properties that get built using this program, if they'll all be um, taxable or it could be that a, a tax exempt company might develop a pro, uh, project as well. But if they were all taxable and we've used 150, uh, 150 new units or <coughs> 1. 1.5 million, that would equate to about 127,000 annual uh, tax bill revenue that would be generated probably on sites that aren't generating much tax right now if it's an undeveloped site, uh, site or a lot. So that would be a monetary return to Polk County for and that's something that would last for years and years in the future. And then the last slide, Claire. So again, we, it kind of comes down to possible next steps. Um, you know, um, what what further would we need, uh, and what steps should be taken? You know, we're not um, 
politically savvy and how that works and governmentally what needs to happen necessarily. We're following the <laughs> process, which was to come and present the general government. But you know, we would continue the discussion, but we'd also like to be able to move forward with the discussion if the county would like to move forward with it to offer this program uh, to those that need it and really to, to make position Polk County as an innovative leader in this area, in an area that's needed, which is senior housing. So if there's other concerns and things that we haven't addressed to this point, um, we're, we're happy to do that, but trying to just bring this to a point where we know what the next steps would be at this point and how we can bring it to some form of, of resolution. Any comments, thoughts? Um, couple of things that I think struck me as, as good in this presentation is one, the review period. So in other words, this doesn't cost us anything uh, except opportunity, I mean, use that money elsewhere, uh, if nothing develops. If something does start to develop, we'll have that money ready to go to put in. One year review, uh, you know, I, I, you know, ideally, we would have a developer standing up here saying, I've been talked to, I've been looking at it, close, this may, this is what we, I would do this. I'd like to take advantage of it. I don't think we have that yet, correct? Well, yeah, I mean, without, uh, there is a development um, happening right now in Amory. It's kind of the land, the infill opportunity I was talking about. So the old city hall there, you know, they moved to the Bremer building. So that the old city hall is being developed into eight units, eight market rate apartment units. Um, the builder of that is interested in this program for four of his eight units to be used in this in this program. So that's one I know of. It's smaller in size, but a little bit helps. Um, but that's one I know of that, that that's being delivered like right now. So it would be um, dedicated to seniors. Four of those units would be dedicated fifty five plus of those eight units that he's built. Also, Vince, we have had multiple developers come into the area who in the past year or two have just left because the numbers didn't work. So we'd be able to go back to them because they had plans ready, surveys, everything taken care of and plotted out. We'd be able to go back to them and say, hey, look, we know it didn't work last year, but we now have this option. Would you be interested? If we designate this, these funds, how long do you anticipate in real estate, would it take to develop the program other than the four units you discussed uh, to get organized and uh, advertised and whatever they do to promote it uh, before the funds would be tied up? Okay. It's a good question. I, I don't know the answer of how long it would take to kind of get through legal and work with, say, uh, West Central Wisconsin Regional Planning Commission on, on the administration of it. I would think that would take at least two or three months. Um, you know, like once we had to go ahead and approve funding from the <clears throat> county board. Can't imagine it would be quicker than that. But I think there would be a couple of things that could be done concurrently. There could be the legal side working on it, and then you know, a group working on okay, how are we going to market this, and be working on a couple of things at the same time. But I would think it would take at least a few months to get it up and saying we're ready to go. Here's how you apply for the funding. Then we would be budgeting it for the 2023 budget year mm -hmm. and uh, okay. committing those funds. Now, you know, the, the one year date we put out there, I mean, if it takes two to three months, you know, even if we said, hey, we don't know exactly how else we might use those funds, we might need them. Even if it were a nine month review or a six month review, just to say, are we making any progress? And if they say we've reached out to all those developers that had initial plans, and if we don't get any takers, can we pull that back and apply it to something else? They, you know, and the other thing I've been thinking about is how do we, you know, we're all aware of the workforce housing shortage. You know, that's what many of us would think. We got to get workers to help our businesses and so on. So is there a way to invest the money there? Probably there might be. I mean, if we're thinking about some things, but at least we also know there is a senior issue uh, based on this. So is it something that, 
you know, you can kind of get two birds with one stone here. If, if, if the, the three examples that they gave here is what we're shooting for, that might work. You know, if you, you, you support, you get the senior housing needs that, that are there in the county would help. And at the same time, you're getting more workers to move into those homes. So, um, you know, this one is a, it, it's a risk, but, but it's not. I mean, it, we don't know that it's going to work, is my feeling, but it's not going to cost us anything other than opportunity loss if there's something we could use that money for now. We, we had that discussion as a team um, just because we knew that was kind of a concern. And I think all three of us agreed as taxpayers in the county, if we put this in place and it's not getting used, we'd be in favor of you know, shut it down, use the money for something else that we'd all benefit from. So um, we're, we didn't put that up begrudgingly. We put that up because it's a really good suggestion that it should, there should be a review period. And however that gets formed, if it's 12 months or nine months, and is it, you know, we need to see 25% of the funds spoken for or 10%, you know, I think those parameters are all up for discussion, but we're very much in favor of that clause. If it's market based, and the examples you used were all market based, why have it, has a developer not jumped in there with the market being what it is to know if it's market based, it should be able to support it? Why has that not happened? What were the reasons they didn't if it's market based? Low income, I get. Yeah. Market based is market based. If the market's there for it, they should be enough to generate that revenue for them to go ahead with the project. Some of the ones that haven't so far is because the infrastructure costs are so high. Um, just getting the roads, lights, sewer, um, you know, curb and gutter all in because the areas that need to be developed are just raw land. Um, Amory has a couple options for development. I know Clear Lake has some, but it requires full development. And that's what's pushing the cost over. Now, like uh, the one slide, we have some cities and villages who have said, you know what, we're willing to help. We know the problem is so big, they're willing to kick some in too. So couple that with this. Now uh, developers have an option of coming in because they're willing to help with some of the infrastructure. And then we would be helping giving some money for the, you know, the list of whatever they need um, and put those two things together and that would make sense for them. And our prices are still high because our inventory is still low. We're at 50% of total inventory that we were at this time last year. That's, it, it's a problem. <laughs> So um, our, our prices in this area are definitely still being kept up where they should be so that they can develop. I see that in St. Croix. They have, I know of three different developments that it's mostly seniors going in. They're not designated senior, but, and, um, and as fast as they're building these units, they're sold. And it's, in fact, I just looked online um, last night and there's like one, for sale now in St. Croix Falls, they're building, they're in the process of building more, but they're selling as fast as they're building. And these are, you know, between 250 and 350 and condo type things. And some are single family, but they're selling. I raised the question then, why isn't it happening more? Or yeah. what? I think well, they can make more money elsewhere sometimes too, like in New Richmond. Obviously, they're able to make a little bit more money there. So incentivizing them and keeping the grant as part of an option, uh, the option here is one of the things that we talked about. We want them to kind of move over. And as some of those um, prices are skyrocketing, it's pushing our prices up here too. As the developer, right, because I kind of had the same type of question um, for the developer that had the proposal in Osceola for the apartments going up. Mm -hmm. I had asked him because I was curious, you know, what, what is it that you guys are looking for in the area to green light a project like this? And he noted some things like you know, access to the healthcare facility. So, and, and I don't remember all of the exact details of what he said were the checklist of things that they kind of want to see. And my guess would be is that some of the areas that we're talking about don't necessarily check those boxes as well as they would like. And so something like this gives them the financial incentive to go in there if they think that you know it's going to be financially worth it, maybe they can be a little more lenient on you know how connected to infrastructure and everything in certain areas. 
And, and that specific project, Carrie and I sat in a meeting a couple of weeks ago, the representative from Gone Companies was the yeah, one doing yeah. that project. Um, they wouldn't be doing that project, which is the old hospital redevelopment site. Now. So they wouldn't be doing that if it weren't for the participation of the village with TIF funding and incentives. You know, I think a lot of these developers, the sophisticated ones, mm -hmm. they're going to do projects that have incentive and projects without incentives. They, they pass by them because they know there's other projects, there's other villages and municipalities and counties that will try and incite them. Um, um, so part of this was to get a reaction, <laughs> which we failed. <laughs> but uh, a reaction in the sense and to, to throw it out there, it, it may be something that we could edit, we could amend. Um, to me, it's not going to work unless you have a village or a city that says they're going to pay the big bill. They're going to pay the infrastructure cost of going. Um, but if, if I were to support this, I would say, well, in six months, you come back with a village and a developer that says, here's our plan. What do you think? Is this qualified? Does this work? Um, yeah. Maybe something that wouldn't take as, as long as a year to figure out. And I'll use this as an example, too. Like you said, the problem that we're running up, up to with a lot of this stuff is you've got the developers want to see municipal involvement. The municipalities want to see either county approval or developer interest. The county wants to see developers ready to go. So we're in this kind of cart before the horse at all levels. And just the, the only thing we can do kind of is provide examples. So with uh, the village of Milltown, their Cedar Corp consultants are working with somebody who wants to build senior housing. I don't know if it's stalled. I don't know the details or anything like that, but I had mentioned to Cedar Corp saying that there was talk of this program and he wants more information on that because he was thinking that that might be the kick in the butt that this developer might need in order to move forward in Milton. So I, I don't want to speak as an expert on any other areas or anything, but I'm guessing that that story is probably not, um, you know, an anomaly as far as the other areas are. It appears to me that that all these elements involved the cities the infrastructure the all these things are waiting nobody's got an answer on what's going to uh, they all have questions i should say to find out uh, what's going to happen how this is going to develop one of the in the county is also obviously involved or would be but if one of the if one of these groups or elements or interested <coughs> parties takes the initiative to say, hey, let's move forward, I think the rest of them would fall in. I think that's probably the, the job for the uh, for the county to, to make a commitment. And uh, we'll get the answer to the rest of them uh, rapidly. I still would go back to, I can tell you from Centuria, what happened in Centuria when they built senior housing and then company that built them and rented those out went and became a non nonprofit and then the tax base was gone they get nothing they still have to pay for fire water based on population but they get nothing they were not able to work out any uh, agreement with seven what's it called impact seven um, um, to be able to get money in lieu of taxes. They've not got any agreement like that. So they, there they are stuck. They now have all this housing that requires, it takes a lot of their um, uh, police time in particular, because they get a lot of calls to that development there. It's not all senior. Some of it has, it's um, lower income too. Whatever the percentages are that that owner has to meet to be able to qualify for nonprofit. But that, that to me, that would be scary for a community saying, yep, bring them in. And then a year from now, the whole tax base goes away. It's it's something to think about because it's happened here. So 
so their business model. Yeah, that's their business model. You go in, you get what you can get, you turn around, because anybody can make, be a nonprofit now. It's get, getting to be a nonprofit is as easy as getting a driver's license practically anymore. I may be exaggerating a bit, but it's really, really easy now. And um, so that's a little scary for communities because they're they're taking risks when they bring in housing developments or apartment complexes that are deemed, you know, like the one where Terry said four of them are senior and four of them, they only have to have a certain percentage in those buildings to qualify to become that nonprofit. It's, I have concerns about that part. And I, I think I've talked to you about it and I've talked to, I know I've talked to Vince about it. I, you know, we need like, like in St. Croix Falls up by the elementary school developments that are between two and 300,000 that people that are getting these jobs can move into. And the seniors, and you gave some examples, but a lot of seniors that I know, they're in their house that they worked their whole life to be able to get. And a lot of those houses are a lot more expensive than these younger people that are coming in can afford to buy. So it's, it's uh, and especially in this area where, where we have so many lakes, um, you get homes that are on the lakes are not, for the most part, going to people that are just coming here, young people looking for jobs. And um, uh, so I, I, I do, I, it's a nice thought. It's, it, it's, I, I don't know how it would work. I don't know. I think, I think they're both very valid points. And the slide that discussed, you know, potential tax benefit and that kind of thing. I think that needs to be seen as a as potential additional benefit, not the primary reason for doing the program. The, the primary, yeah. primary reason has to be adding to our housing stock. Yeah. And in the second example you gave, I agree. Some of the workforce housing, they're probably not gonna be buying the lake place, but maybe there's someone in a development not on a lake, not a first time home buyer, that could move into that lake yeah. place and then their house opens up. So maybe it may be a couple of degrees of separation to when that stock opens up for workforce housing. But I think I think there could be that trickle down um, that could still benefit. And it does help in communities where they already have like the one of the, the developments in St. Croix that I'm talking about, they already have water and sewer districts and stuff. They're um, that big development <coughs> behind Menards there where all the water and sewer limit was put in and then that developer made a bus and it all sat there in the county. We have a lot of that land here through the county. And now that area is being developed and um, they're building new homes back there as fast as, in fact, all the ones that are in construction now must be sold because they haven't even had them advertised anymore. So it's, that tells me that he sold them or they'd be advertised, <laughs> which is a good thing, but I think we get into some of the other communities that are not as big and they don't have that infrastructure in place already. And, I think that's why they're they're open. Well, I would assume that they're open to those discussions. And what I talked to see about is, you know, the types of things that they'd have to look at is, you know, are you willing to kick in on getting utilities hooked up? Are you willing mm -hmm. to, you know, are you in the discussion of a tip district and things yeah. like that? And that's again not trying to put words in anybody's mouth, but those are things that they're open to the discussion on because um, their ears kind of perked up a little bit when it came to like, oh, we could you know, throw somebody a bone to encourage them to come to Milltown, you know, where they otherwise maybe wouldn't have. But yeah, I, I get what you're saying. I'm not sensing a consensus for one way or the other. Uh, so we can maybe to, to move on. Do you want to take a straw poll here or would you rather get to me one-on-one -on -one later and say, here are my thoughts in terms of whether or not I include it as an option in the budget or not, you know. Uh, Mr. Chair, do you have a preference on how we do this? Well, my concern would be to almost kind of where you stand on it from your budget standpoint. Or is this something that you would consider putting in your budget? Because we surely don't need to have come back after you do all your work and tell you uh, we're putting up in the past. Yeah. 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 With and all yeah. yeah, everybody being aware of what's happened, right? Like broadband. I mean, I I think we're all aware that that was a good spot to put money, and we did. But you know, so is this? 
Well, and that's where if 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 I got a consensus and and, I, and everybody said, you know, this is a good idea, we should do it, then I could probably say we're going to sacrifice something else and you know put it in as an option for the whole full board to decide. Um, if I get a consensus that I don't think this is going to work, I won't bother with. Kind of yeah, well, I just wouldn't want to see five supervisors kill something that the other 15 may be in favor of. Mm -hmm. And they yeah. haven't even had a presentation. Right. Yeah. Well, I don't know that polling us five gives it a fair look. No. Yeah. You mentioned broadband. I happen to have a note on that right here. So we allocated that money to broadband and they got some grants were awarded. So some of that money is going to be used, right? <laughs> Interestingly, at this point, uh, Lakeland has not chosen to take that money. Oh, really? Right. Uh, I think the belief is, one, it helped them secure that uh, the grant, <clears throat> but now they're at the point of, it will be so expensive for us where we're going to put 500 feet of that initial drop that it would burn more than the money they're getting. So they may choose to save the taxpayer money is one way to put it, or to say, we're not going to uh, do that. But they'll continue with their money. So that money that we all get, what was it? One and a half million or something? One. one million? How long then does that money stay allocated to that broadband yeah. project? Well, until somebody changes it, or the next step is I've already had one of the local internet service providers reach out and say, hey, we're working on a edging out project, which is a worthwhile project. So probably the next step is to come back to the board and say, do you want to amend this resolution we had with the 500 foot drop and, and do we want to amend it, to shorten it to 100 foot or to eliminate it? To encourage that edging out yeah, to occur yeah. faster. So we could use the money that way. Yeah, because this is kind of the same. We've got that million and a million and a half, it would be. And so if after six months, you know, a little bit of it gets used. I mean, in order for it to, because I was looking at the numbers, in order for it to recycle itself, so you it's a continuous thing. I mean, even if you did the million and a half, you're not getting that much back every year. Payment, repayment over 10 years. I mean, that's not going to be enough to keep it going. I mean, this, if we would approve this, we'd have to be okay with it's going to need more money. It's going to need more money. And that's part of what we discussed. I'm sorry. Yeah. That's part of what we discussed, though, is that the way that we're looking at it is with this 1.5 million investment. If that gets depleted over time because you're only getting half back in the over 10 years. Right. So, but if that gets depleted over time, the hope is that the program would have been successful. Like it doesn't require more funding from the county unless we were to come back and say, you know what, that works so well that we want to put more money in. So if the 1.5 million was used up um just on its own over time, the hope would be that we look at that and say, okay, we've Added units here, 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 and our job is, you know, yeah. done. So that that's what Terry was talking about when he said there's no requirement for additional funding because the hope would be that if it's if it is that popular, then that's what they keep saying that's a good problem to have that the money's gone and it, it potentially does not need to be rebuilt. Whereas over, you know, initially it could fund 150 units over the course of 20 years with the relatively slow repayment of those funds yeah. if they're all rentals. Um, you know, it'd be like 225 units over 20 years. If the county put no more dollars into it, would we sitting here 20 years from now say it was a good program? We added 225 units of senior housing in our county. It could be, and, and it wouldn't require funding in addition to the rental. I think the big challenge is would a developer say ten thousand dollars per unit is worth it yeah i think most would say no and it's not ten it, 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 it equates to five thousand per unit because they have to repay after right. that but 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 as jay had said does it generate 
momentum? Does it create a spark? Does it give us something to go out and recruit to someone? If it does, great. If it doesn't, it doesn't cost us anything. You know, so yeah. I think unfortunately at this timeline, we may be setting ourselves up to fail for that very reason. You know, these developers are all busy. They're all struggling to get materials to finish projects they've got. They've got all kinds of projects on the docket that they can't get going on. I think you could put this out there and at this time in the marketplace, it maybe doesn't get any momentum and maybe we tarnish it for a time when the economy isn't rolling as hot as it is and they actually have need for development and need for business that we don't have today. Good point. But what could happen and something that we've talked about is some of those smaller builders and developers can utilize it because they have a lot less overhead. So maybe those big developers aren't the one coming in and doing, you know, 30 units, but we have some people doing four or five, 10 units, and it will make a difference for them. And then don't forget, we want to couple them with the villages and the towns that are willing to kind of kick in as well. That's a good question, though, because then who coordinates all this? Who's, is it going to be, who's going to coordinate with the towns, and the villages, and the county, and developer who's going to be the yeah who's going to be like the point person that so our hope is to get a kind of an administrative partnership with west central wisconsin yeah. that's kind of our first choice um that would lay out what the program is really that's kind of the work of i'd say you know if it's aaron sundin with their construction who is here you know that's what he's there to do is to say okay i've got this program from polk county i know about it and we have our material and then they say, we want to do a project in Amory. Okay, so you're probably contacting Amory administrator and saying, this is the project, this is the market study, because they all do their own market studies and say, what can you guys do? So it's kind of on the kind of on the developer to I think seek out what resources they could get and kind of leverage what they can. This work makes a good point. It's not like we have to do this right now. Um, but I, I think, you know, I'm still looking for that surge of interest, that that something that says, hey, this is going to, let's do this. Um, that's what I'm waiting, you know, is there a developer, one thing if you had a developer here saying, <clears throat> here's my plan, 25 units, here's where I've done in Shoreview, here's what I've done in a nominee, and I'm going to do one here, but we don't have that. And then I worry about the four units. If that's what we're shooting for, which is great, then my question is, does it become a, a situation where not only do we not get the tax benefit, but is it something down the road that the village is going to say, this is an expense? I think there's a lot of questions about that. I think, Russ, I, I like what you said. I think it's something the whole board should be involved in. I don't think it should just be by the rest. Right. And maybe it's something that we need a resolution. Is there a supervisor or someone who says, I think this is a, a good route to go so that we can discuss it in a board meeting? I haven't had anybody bring that resolution forward. I mean, I can do that. I. My only question, since I'm on that committee, is that okay? Sure. Yeah. Well, yeah, I'm I'd, I'd definitely be willing to do that. Yeah. Get it in front of the entire board. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And then we definitely get a consensus. Yeah. They all. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I do too. Well, I think that was a big part of what you guys wanted to do is to get it out of here. To get it to the board so we can get that idea of you know even just the tipping if anybody's leaning good idea or not well, yeah we, we appreciate the conversation today and that's exactly kind of what we were hoping as an outcome of today might be you know, we're all professionals with other outside jobs we're just volunteering to try and yeah. benefit what we think would be a benefit to the county so we're kind of that point of hoping that it would move to that point where we can say hey the whole board wants to go forward or they don't it's also good for bankers and real estate people. Sure. sure. <laughs> we love economic development. And EDC guys. Exactly. Yeah, that's why we have a vested interest. Exactly. You're right. 
<laughs> and older people who want to sell their home. <laughs> yeah. We all have an interest. So what I don't know if it would make this budget cycle a little weird. I mean things are things are moving quickly. Yeah. But, um, you know, I, I suppose we could get a, a resolution in the October meeting. And and we'll have that that option of ARPA funds, which you know, we'll have some options there of how we think that should be used, which is now basically in our general fund. And this could be one of those options. All right. That's all we'll handle it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We will have an update regarding the budget process. Yeah, of the purchase of the new Maybe they did not want to. Where's that? No. Number eight. Yeah. Um, the update is this. I have gone back to uh, the sheriff and to Community Services Division to say we seem to have gone from no command center to full boat seven hundred fifty thousand right. dollars, and, I, and I, basically my directive was that's not acceptable. We're not going to do that. Uh, so we are looking at options now, which we will present as an option in the budget. Those options may range from. $175,000, $350,000, to $500,000. Um, just with that alone, uh, just that discussion, uh, our latest bid from the company that said $750,000 has now adjusted the size of what they proposed to us, and it's down to $580,000. So my point is, I'm not comfortable saying we have to go to a brand new unit, but rather let's look at what's it cost to fix that one up, how long will it last? And we think that could be in the 150,000, 175,000 range. I don't know, maybe maybe they'll look at it and say, no, that's not gonna work. Uh, is there another used one that these companies do retrofit and all that? Could we do it for 250,000, 300,000 that will last us so many years. Um, the five hundred eighty thousand dollar—that's the same unit that they designed, our folks designed, but with four feet less. Well, and that's with the commercial RV, you know, chassis and all that. So the question is, hey, could we go with an RV chassis? Um, so Don Burroughs has, has been tasked with finding the answers to those options, and that's where we are. So hopefully, in the next few weeks. I'll be seeing a, a list of to do, and I'll be making a recommendation one way or the other in the budget. Questions, comments? Good. Right. How about an annual budget review of the county board budget development? Good morning, everyone. Some of you have seen me up here before, and you're uh, if you start to nod off because it's the second or third time, I totally understand. But uh, what we're going to be doing today is reviewing where we are with the 2023 fiscal budget. So, Claire, if you'll advance and let me know if I'm too much in the way. This is just an overview of where we are in the process. So, uh, the red dots are committee meetings, uh, and uh, the green or blue dots are full board meetings. So we're in this period where we're going to each of the committees and talking about the budget, where we stand, what, what expenses are starting to look like, what revenues are starting to look like, and also the sorts of requests that are coming in from departments and divisions. Uh, next Tuesday, oops, sorry. <laughs> 
Next Tuesday, Vince and I will be presenting an overview uh, at the board meeting um, where folks who have only seen pieces of the budget will now see the whole thing. So no. uh, we'll come back to committees uh, in next month's cycle and talk about specific budget requests that departments have made um, and where those stand and we'll get your input on those specifics. The 18th of October is where we have the big discussion, full board. Uh, my understanding is that Vince will bring a list of options in for the board to consider in terms of additional funding requests and priorities. 25th, the budget goes to the paper. And then on the 15th of November, by statute, it has to be approved. So that's kind of the overview of where we are. Any questions about the timeline? Keep going, Claire. Uh, I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this slide. Uh, in terms of budgeting principles, uh, we want to get levy dollars in the budget last. We want to maximize external revenue. We want all of our expenses uh, to the greatest degree we can to, uh, to focus on board priorities. Any, any questions about sort of the principal side of this? There you go. Ahead. So what are we seeing on the expense side for FY23? Those of you who are, uh, you know, been listening to uh, news reports know that uh, inflation is is uh, been very high and is possibly moderating. But when it comes to thinking about a cost of living adjustment for our employees, uh, we're seeing a pretty big range across the 20 counties that we've surveyed uh, in Wisconsin, from 2% on the low side to 7%. When we look at our peer counties in this area, we're seeing uh, discussions of 3 to 4% for COLA for the cost of living adjustment. Last year, we did 2.9. For modeling purposes, this year, we're in the 3 to 4% range. So we're running models with, uh, with COLA for each of the employees come in uh, at 3, 2.5, or we'll see where we end up. Uh, there's a component to employee wages called merit. And uh, for the recent past, that merit allocation has been 2%. We're looking at the same 2% for this year. There is a change, however, and we'll be discussing this a little bit more in a subsequent uh, agenda item today. But we're looking at expanding uh, the merit plan. Uh, at this point, it only goes up to what's called uh, market rate. So if an employee starts uh, on the progression at the close to the minimum and moves up, they get that 2%. Right now, it's truncated if they get market rate. So if you've got an employee that's been here for a while or came in higher and they're at market or above, there's no ability to give them a merit. Uh, the board has asked us, administration, to develop a performance evaluation plan that includes uh, pay for performance. Um, we would like to expand think conceptually about being able to do that for all employees, not just employees uh, up to the market. So we'll hear a little bit more about that in the subsequent agenda item. A big part of the employee expenses, of course, healthcare. We've had some very good years, some very fortunate years. Uh, and even our actuaries are saying that from uh, 22 to 23, our direct expense for healthcare ought to be pretty flat, about $4.6 million. Uh, our goal has been and will remain to try to keep employee premiums at a minimum. And if the increase is at a minimum, we're even flat. We do have some flexibility, and we'll talk a little bit about more, uh, more about flexibility in a second, uh, more generally, but we have a fairly robust health fund. Remember the accountant's discussion back in September? Uh, he says it's time to spend that down even more than we have been. Had discussions about the wisdom of that in other meetings. Uh, but we can use that health fund to defray employee employee expenses related to healthcare or departmental expenses. So that's sort of uh, the expense side for employees. Any questions about that? Okay, we'll go on. So now we're going to talk about expenses that aren't related to employees. Uh, we started our budget process with increasing all departmental budgets by uh, 1.5%. We're also modeling a flat scenario where there'd be no increase. And we're also looking at a situation where we would decrease operating expense not related to employees. Why are we doing that? It's a dynamic environment. We've got budget pressures. Uh, and this is just, this item here is just to remind people that uh, non-employee operating expense is everything from equipment repair, uh, 
mileage to take the cars. Okay, capital side. And we're going to, we've got a, a document in here. Uh, it's a thicker document. So we get capital requests from our departments. If you go to the second page here, you'll see that right now we've got about $14 million in capital expense requests. These range from software to trucks. Last year, we approved about 5.8. So the point of this is that we're heavy right now with capital requests. It's the job of administration to winnow those down. We're not going to be able to spend $14 million on capital requests. So this is a draft capital budget. The administrator will be working with departments to skinny that down. A lot. <laughs> <laughs> Where do you? It, I, I see. Yeah, we're, yeah. 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 I think we're getting into the a, a, a subsequent agenda, uh, another subsequent agenda item. But I just wanted to point out where we are in the budget process is we've got all the requests in, and. Uh, We've got to go through those one by one, and make determinations about where our priorities are. And you'll have an opportunity to look at a windowed list over the next month. If that makes sense. The big grab bag is 14 million. Last year, if it was 14 million, we got it down to about 5.8. We're going to need to do that same kind of squeezing, uh, or people will be unhappy. Any questions about where I've gone so far? Okay, we'll go to the next slide. So it, I think this may be the, the squishiest slide in the deck, but it may also be the most important. Revenue, what's flexible, what's not flexible? And maybe this is mostly for folks who haven't been uh, part of the board before, but we have really very little control over the levy. We can decide to accept it all, but we can't increase it. There are ways we can increase it if we bonded for building projects, but we'd just be increasing it to pay for the projects we were, we were building. But assuming we're not doing that, the levy is relatively flat. The last uh, couple of years, we've not taken the full levy. We're just trying to get all the tools out on the table. Uh, one of the options for us will be to take the full levy or in, like we have in the past, maybe we'll send it back to taxpayers. Another item that we have no control over is sales tax. Now, the good news is we have, for over the last three years, underestimated our sales tax. We've had very unusual years, however. As an example, in 21, um, we budgeted 3.6 million in sales tax. We brought in 4.6. We added a, a million to the bottom line, but it was it was a one-off year. We don't expect to see that again. <laughs> but uh, semi-flexible would be items like grants, extra, extramural funding. So we have control over what we can apply for. We don't have control over what we get. But we want to encourage departments in every instance to apply for grants that make sense, particularly ones like broadband that connect to a priority. That's been a big priority in the past. Okay, what's flexible? Well, again, all tools on the table. We've probably got about $6 million in the general fund. That the board can spend as it sees fit before it hits its reserve limit of 14 million. So that 28 million, about 14, you've put aside for a really, really rainy day. And you've got about 6 million or so that you can make decisions about. Now, that's not 6 million this year, the 6 million next year, and 6 million the year after that. That's the 6 million that you've got in the table. The health plan fund, as I mentioned, is also somewhat flexible. We can spend that down at a slow pace, a medium pace, or a fast pace. If we spend, spend it down at a fast pace, what happens in a few years is we've got to start increasing employee contributions to health funds. We may have to make some very tough budget decisions because essentially the cost of health care will go up for us. Our consultants are saying that we've got about $1.6 million for the bonding capacity that we're not using right now. We want to stay below about $2.5 million in debt service each year. We could borrow at current rates about $1.6 million and not exceed that. 
folks so often like to talk about borrowing money, but it's an option and we want to make sure you're aware of everything that's on the table. So inflexible down to flexible. Any questions? And our debt ratio is is like relatively low compared to other counties, right? Well, our you know the math on it is we've got borrowing capacity of over 250 million and to stay below the threshold of the statute. We can't possibly raise the levy enough to get there without, you know, a whole lot of development bringing the, the levy up to, you know, <laughs> nonsensical levels. So, but we are very low with our, with our uh, the amount of debt we take on to the size of our county. So that's why we have some capacity. It's nice to hear. It's nice to hear. It is, and I only bring that up because I agree. I, I I promise I'm not trying to say open it up, <laughs> but I <laughs> but I but I do you know want to poke a little bit and say you know we also want to make sure that we're not being so restrictive as to not take any opportunities. That's why I asked. That. Yeah. So that, uh, you may have seen the graph from our consultants on this, but if we don't borrow any money, our uh, we're, we're, we're retiring that debt over time. Every year we retire more and more. So this number, unless we do something, the, our capacity will, or the amount available, our bonding availability will go up as we pay down debt. To a point where, you know, we may wonder, we may be wondering if we're not, you know, taking on projects that we could take on. Right. Um, okay, so got that done. Let's go on to the next slide. Revenue side. Um, last year we brought in, or we budgeted $2.38 million uh, for levy. We're estimating about 20, uh, 20, 23.8 million in 22, this current year, 24.3. As one of the other supervisors pointed out in the past meeting, on the levy side, that's only going to give us about a half million more dollars. We've got a, a roughly $70 million budget. Um, it's a squeeze every year for levy. Uh, we'll get the exact number uh, more solid after 915. We don't even get the state forms till then. I've pointed out already that we haven't always used all the levy. I mentioned uh, what have we done with sales tax previous years? We're right now um, we're 95 percent confidence intervals, 4.25 million on sales tax for next year, 90 percent confidence and interval 4.6. So our um, our sales tax budget will likely be almost definitely be in that range. Important bullet here: external funding. Um, we're not going to have the big inflows that we've had. Last couple of years. We're not seeing it anyway. And we hope that we don't have a situation that arises that puts us back in that situation. I guess, but uh, we're not we're not anticipating any COVID revenues. Um, big new tranches of money coming. Any questions about the revenue side? That is too. The thing that keeps Don and me awake at night sometimes is we have to anticipate what's going to happen with the economy and property tax. So we know we're going to draw some. Things go south. I'm not saying they will, but there's some risk. If they go really south, then we have more defaults and less revenue. Yeah, we're, we're, nobody wants to go back to 2008. We'll go on to the next slide. So um, you've got. The capital document here with that 4. Million, 4, uh, 4. 14 million. I can't talk this morning. I don't know if I'm 14 million dollar number. Um, that's capital. We're getting also requests for operating expense from departments that are connected to general government. Um, you'll see these in more detail next month. Just a couple of examples. You know, we're seeing some personnel related requests. This is generally speaking, someone's doing a different job than they were. They're, they're doing more work. They take on some supervisory responsibility. We want to take them up a step in our scale. There's a small amount of money associated with that. We're getting those kinds of requests. We're getting a few requests for new FTEs. Um, and we're, you know, we're getting a lot of capital requests. So here's one from IT, about $400,000 worth of switches and Servers for 23. What's the next slide? FTE for corporate counsel request, and then some other uh, personnel related operating. So 
So those are, those are the sorts of things we're looking at. And once we do some winnowing, we'll bring the stack into this committee for um, requests that are related to these departments. And then in the big board meeting, we'll come with all of those and let you make some decisions. Any questions? So where does the funding request for the outside entities like the fair, the uh, EDC, the museum, that kind of stuff? Uh, we have all those. Uh, we have a general feel for what we're going to do on that, but I'll be presenting the specifics uh, in October. Yeah. Uh, we have, you know, what we look at, just so you know, is, is what they've gotten in the past what they do, what they've done with that money, and then what other types of resources do they have? And sometimes that's not, we don't always get that clear picture, but Don has done a little work to say, how much do they get from fundraising? How much revenue do they get? How do we compare in our giving to that organization with other counties giving to similar yeah. organizations? So we look at those things. So we're, based on what Don is showing you, I'll give you the the spoiler, we're going to be looking stringently at those things and we're setting the expectations to not expect a lot of increase. Any other comments, questions? <clears throat> um, do we want to do our Full session, or should we check some of our other things in open? Close the yeah, we can play with once we go into full session, it's just it always seems like when we come back, we won't get right on again. We so, like you're talking about moving on to well, capital improvement planning, oh. annual audit results. We could leave the work plan and subject matters when we come out, but did you want to talk about capital improvement planning and yeah? yeah. Good before we go in the full yeah. session. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, capital improvement. If we're going to go to that, you've got the draft document in your hand. And um, if you, if there's, there's a summary page on page two that um, lines everything up according to major categories of revenue and expenditures. Um, and then as you go through the document, you'll see uh, the various departments within our organization and what the requests are. So one way to look at this is to, uh, if you if there's particular uh, departments or items that departments may be requesting that you would like to learn more about, um, you can review this and then we'll have you know a document to refer to for our discussion. Uh, Mo mentioned a minute ago, uh, the JC roof re replacement. I apologize, these page numbers aren't uh, numbered. Pages aren't numbered. But on the, I believe it's the third page, you'll see uh, basically uh, facilities request. And you'll see that uh, JC roof re replacement at 2.6 million on that page. So things that you've been hearing about ought to show up in this document. If they don't, let us know. Um, and we'll make sure that we do the forensic to find out if. They've fallen off, or it's just a mistake. And uh, I just I feel bad about emphasizing and reemphasizing, but uh, this list will be smaller the next time you see it because we have to do a lot of work on it. I guess the critical thing is if if you're aware of a capital project and you you are unsure about whether we've got it covered. You should let us know so we can talk to a department or division director to make sure it's in the consideration set. We want to make sure we're considering everything that's important to the board. Uh, one question, and maybe this is maybe for you more, more. If things were budgeted for this year that for whatever reason didn't get finished because we couldn't get people to do it or whatever, does that carry over? Be in the carryover resolution next. June. Okay. Uh, so I'm, I'm talking like the painting of the Lanesdale School funds. Right. Um, that would carry over then. Right. That'd be part of that rollover as, okay. as we go come to that resolution of after the audit of what would be spent. Well, 
So for today, we're not going to be going through this, and we're not going to try to whittle these down. You're going to whittle them down. You're going to take the first crack at it, and then we'll get our chance to uh, throw something back in or take something out. But for today, it's just these are just the requests. Right. So we need to review these and get a feel for the types of things the county that you know staff or whoever. What's the total if we get them all? About 14, 14 million. million. 14 million. Yeah. 14 million. Yeah. Where did these figures come from? They come from the, the departments, each division already. Yeah, they're, they're, they've proposed these, right? Okay. You, you can imagine. I mean, let's say that every one of them is worthy, but we can't do them all. So then you have to say, what is it we're going to do? And why and how? Most worthy. And in other words, just get pushed. That's, that's absolutely correct. And uh, they end up either being permanently unfunded almost <laughs> or deferred maintenance projects that you know come back later to require consideration, right? And then just to look on a summary page, the key is to look at what's unfunded and what's funded. Um, on that summary page to see where, where that number is, and that number is like three million. Um, as far as highway goes, I, I have received some um, approval for some grants and stuff. So I'll get those numbers to Don and do have some more funding that's coming out of some of those projects. And some of those projects they utilize ARPA funds and the debt payments. Spend some more time on this, or are we moving on? Well, so is the is the um, command center <coughs> in here somewhere? Not in there yet. Okay. Sorry, yeah. no, okay. For what? The command center. Well, no, never in the capital improvement plan. Well, it never was never before. Was. No, yeah. no. And that's the that's, that's why. We'll put that up as an option, possibly when we get a clear number. That Dollar, yeah, and then uh, you know, it's probably one of those where even though the ARPA funds are now in our general fund, we'll, we still have that kind of earmark to say these are the ARPA dollars, yeah, and that's one of those projects where people have pretty much assume if we're going to do this, let's do it from that money that we're handling. Just because we got an update on it before, is the plan and fall in the projects. It's yeah, where was that? Yeah, I saw it. Yeah, it's right here. Second to the last, third to the last. Last page at the bottom. Oh, yeah. I think it's 3.1. Three point one is a, just the estimate for cost. If you remember, we got $2 million from the state. Yeah. We can apply for a grant to get up to another four hundred thousand, or so matching grant after that two million spent. Right, so fifty thousand. So then you know I still leave the chunk. Now this is just an estimate on the yeah. cost. Yeah. Uh, mobile will work as much. You can take that down. <laughs> <laughs> Be better. It's <laughs> on his list. <laughs> Anything else on the capital improvement plan? Now we're going to move to the annual audit. This is sort of a slow moving train. And uh, you see, you've gotten the presentation on the draft audit report from Jonathan from CLA back in September. Uh, what's changed since then is that they've begun work on our compliance audit. Uh, that's uh, has to be turned in to the state by the 30th of September. Um, at that point, we will get a list of recommendations for management in terms of how to adjust our internal accounting uh, processes and procedures to be in better compliance uh, with auditing with standards. 
Uh, we've gotten a little bit of an opening of the kimono of what some of the issues might be. So far, we're not, the, the consultants have said they're relatively minor, uh, but we'll have uh, likely at the October General Government Committee uh, our opinion about their opinion on what they recommend. So uh, those, uh, the, the, the figures that you saw Jonathan present back in September, there's been absolutely no change to those. Uh, the county had a good year, uh, banks, uh, uh, for a sizable amount of money. Uh, the general fund is relatively flush. Um, now we're into the compliance uh, part, what we did right, and maybe what we didn't do so well. We'll on that. Questions, comments? Anything else on the agenda you want to go through before we go into our closed session? If not, we need a motion under Wisconsin Stat 19.851G to go into our closed session. I'll make a motion under that Wisconsin Stat to go into closed session. I'll second it. Well, we're supposed to have a roll call vote, so let's maybe Ryan, yes or no? Yes. 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 Yeah. And who will be in our closed session? I think the committee and the lawyers. A couple of things to take care of yet. Um, we're going to review and update our 2022 committee work plan. Anything we need to add on there or anything we're not getting done? Hopefully, we'll have four. I'll have Ryan. We'll talk. Maybe we'll get Lee involved to, to say how do we draft this resolution on uh, senior housing. But we'll be talking a little bit more on budget. Otherwise, we're on schedule on our work plan. I think so. Yeah. All right. How about subject matter for our next meeting? Anybody have anything they'd like on the agenda or, or talk about? Or... Do you need to add anything? Or do we have enough to do? I, I think uh, it. We'll just add that resolution yeah. to show it to you. And uh, well, over my resolution. sense is, is, is that I don't have a recommendation come from this committee, but that'll be for you guys to decide if you want to recommend or not. Um, I just want to throw it out there for discussion and kind of like you guys said, a reaction. So talking with the law enforcement in Milltown, they've been stuck with two uh, part-time positions that have been unable to be filled for, I don't even know how long now. And so the two officers in Milltown have been just swapping weekends of overtime. And I, we haven't had a chance to talk yet, but I just wanted to ask him, not, not, him, not implying that the county can step in and do anything or anything, but just ask him what he thinks uh, it would take to get those positions some interest or anything like that. And I just wanted to see if anybody else, as they talk to anybody that they know, if, if the same thing is happening in their areas or anything like that. Um, just because I know these guys are burnt out. That's crazy. And I don't know if there's anything that we can do to incentivize part time positions for municipalities or anything like that. Um, I just wanted to throw it out there to see if there's. Right. Is it something you want to get on the on our agenda for our next meeting, or is it something you want to bring to public protection and get it on their agenda? Or yeah, yeah. okay, maybe yeah, so try to get it on public protection agenda yeah. so they can start. At least if we're talking about it, the homes and villages mm -hmm. the whole. Yeah, that, that it's on the radar. No, nope. yeah, because the the hard part is is that might not just be uh, that the position isn't attractive because Sean Thayer and Milton was saying that uh, there just aren't people in the academy no, right. that 
So, you know, I'm not trying to put a solution where it's not going to solve yeah. anything. I just. Friends and let's not, the same let's not get. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Let's not get too much conversation either because it okay. isn't on our agenda. And probably it would be more appropriate to. So bring it to public protection and then get it on their agenda and then they can. Then they can. Any subject matters anyone wants for our next meeting? I guess if you have something, get a hold of Vince or I don't know. Well, yeah, get a hold of somebody. And me, I mean, I'll try to get it on the agenda if we can. Anything else? We've got one item left. I'll make a motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 And adjourned at 10.20.